resume the recording. Uh, so good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to, if I'm remembering correctly, the 72nd uh, meeting of the monthly meeting of the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group. Uh, and uh, we're doing this meeting this month entirely virtually. We don't have a face-to-face -face component to today's meeting. Uh, we are recording, so if you don't wish to be uh, recorded, then you should uh, leave the meeting uh, now. Uh, so as uh, I will spend a few moments just introducing uh, the group uh, to everybody. Some of the folks who have joined the call today are, are new. Uh, and then uh, I'll hand it over to our three speakers today who I will also uh, at least very briefly introduce. Uh, the agenda and the minutes uh, for today's meeting, sorry, the agenda and the attendees for today's meeting are in the wiki page that I've been uh, putting into the chat. Uh, and so uh, we tend not to do introductions uh, to save taking away from uh, uh, meeting time, but uh, hopefully feel people feel uh, confident and, and uh, open enough to uh, ask questions, uh, which you can do either. Uh, we'll ask the speakers to indicate how they'd like to handle questions, whether on going uh, through it or right at the end. Uh, and uh, typically with questions, we uh, people can ask them out loud or through the chat. Uh, we do both. So the Strongly Sustainable Business Model Group, we are a community of almost 1,400 people. We're at 1,398 as of uh, a few minutes ago. Uh, and uh, we uh, were created in 2012 by myself and Peter Jones uh, and Nabil Harbush and uh, Jeremy Bowes, uh, all associated with OCAD University. But uh, we're now a community of, of uh, much bigger than that uh, with people from around the world as, as demonstrated on this call. I think we have uh, uh, at least three continents on the call uh, today. Uh, we have a number of focus areas which are listed on the wiki and, and that first link there and we have a number of projects of our members going on. Uh, this is a group uh, for, for our members by our members so it's really up to all of you to decide what you want to uh, work on. And our purpose really is to explore how to enable entrepreneurs and established businesses to realize enterprises, enterprises that choose to fl choose flourishing as their goal uh, i.e. strong sustainability uh, uh, informed by what science says is possible and likely and by what our values tell us is, is desirable. Uh, so uh, I want to start with a quick uh, acknowledgement. Uh, wherever we all are, we're on sacred land uh, and we're privileged to be on that land wherever we happen to be today. Uh, the land nearby lakes and sea has obviously supported uh, human beings for thousands of years and is rich in history, knowledge and tradition. And we're privileged to be the beneficiaries and stewards of all that has come before on behalf of the Senate's seven generations to come and beyond. And we invite you all to consider in your place how you honor and respect uh, people's indigenous to your place, which may of course be you yourself. Uh, just as a, uh, and lastly today, uh, each place around the world is increasingly a home to peoples from across the world. And we're each grateful to have the opportunity to be where we are today. Um, I would just um, say that uh, this uh, type of acknowledgement is something we did, uh, do now in Canada on a regular basis uh, when we start meetings to acknowledge the First Nations. Of course, typically we would mention the First Nations on whose land we are, uh, but in this case today, uh, I'm not doing that uh, since we're being uh, virtual and to accommodate all of you. Uh, this is where we would normally be. We would be in the bottom part of this building uh, in the photograph. And uh, I would just ask you to reflect from a place perspective, do you know where you are today? Uh, and for those of us who would normally be in the room, we'd be sit sit sitting on a watershed called Russell Creek uh, that we, uh, they, we buried to become uh, a sewer in the mid 1870s, uh, not certain of the indigenous names. And of course, this session is uh, interdependent with this place, uh, the places we're all in, uh, in a very in important ways, uh, the sewerage being one of the most obvious ones, and for those of you who know one of the tools of one of the projects of our members, the Flourishing Business Canvas, uh, we have the opportunity to start connecting our businesses uh, and our business models to uh, the uh, vital biophysical stocks and the solar powered ecosystem services in the, each of our watersheds that we are all interdependent on. Um, so the group goals, uh, we're a group or community of innovation practice. We're a knowledge mobilization initiatives. Uh, as I mentioned, we're for our members, by our members, so people self-organize uh, with a particular focus on small, medium enterprises um, on the basis that these are organizations that are more likely to be able to adapt and adopt uh, our ideas more easily than larger organizations. And um, that's enough of that. Uh, we have a number of projects of our uh, members going on. Uh, these are probably some of the larger ones, uh, Future Fit, Flourish It, Lead for Flourishing, Aim to Flourish, Refocus, 
Flourishing Enterprise Innovation Toolkit and Reporting 3.0. Uh, there's a short introduction to all of these projects on our wiki, and obviously most of these projects have their own websites uh, that you can learn more about uh, there. And all of the leaders of all of these projects would welcome members getting more involved and engaged in uh, various different ways. Uh, we're also making connections. So I just wanted to highlight for those of you who may not know uh, that uh, uh, particularly in Europe, there's a large international conference on new business models. The next one is in June in Berlin next year, hosted by Dr. Florian ludecker freund uh, And uh, uh, there's currently a call for papers out for this and in fact a call for session um, leads for this. So if, you, if you've got a paper you'd like or a session you'd like to organize on a particular topic, uh, please uh, submit that by the end of September and then papers will be due, if I remember correctly, at the end of January. Uh, next, uh, Systemic Design, the uh, international conference relating systems thinking and design. Uh, the next iteration of this conference is Turin in October. Again, uh, this conference last year had a theme of flourishing uh, and this is co-organized uh, by usually the Oslo School of Architecture and OCAT. Uh, and there's lots of related things to uh, intersection points between our work and there. Uh, reporting 3.0 recently came out with a blueprint for new business models, uh, which a number of us in this group uh, contributed to. So this is, uh, that community's work is, is connected. Uh, there was a really nice article by uh, Florian uh, in uh, a journal of community production. Uh, giving a summary of our field uh, from an academic standpoint uh, recently. Uh, and uh, Florian also runs our blog, uh, which you can also get to here and at uh, blog.sspmg.com. And lastly, there's the, um, both the leaders of the Global B Corp academic community are members of this group, as are a number of the other members. Uh, so there's another intersection point there. I won't go through that slide. Um, and I won't go through that slide. Um, I am looking for help. Uh, to help uh, run the group uh, practically uh, and uh, if anybody's interested in, in contributing then uh, uh, Skype me uh, or send me a text message here. Uh, and all of these slides and all of the slides the presenters are making will be in the Google Drive folder for this group uh, and for this meeting um, shortly after the meeting ends and the link uh, will be provided in the uh, comments to the post that announced this meeting uh, uh, in LinkedIn, which you can get to from the wiki page. So with uh, all of that said, and apologies for going fast, I didn't want to take too much time from our speakers, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Angela, John and Panos, uh, who uh, have been working together for, between themselves for quite a number of years now uh, on, an, on a variety of, pro of projects related to the viable systems model. Um, and um, recently uh, I had the, the honor of being able to sit with uh, Angela and John um, with Panos being uh, remote uh, to explore some of the work that Panos and I have been doing with other members to start to integrate uh, the use of the Flourishing Business Canvas with VSM uh, in a client engagement uh, for strategy development and uh, so we thought it would be interesting to have uh, all three of them here today to talk about all of the various combinations and permutations of, of all of that. Uh, I should mention that Angela and John have uh, recently uh, had the second edition of their book published and the front cover is there on the, the left hand side of the screen. So uh, this is uh, a book to be recommended as, as well. So uh, with all of that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and, and uh, Angela, if you would like to uh, uh, share yours. Okay. And uh, I, I hand it over to yourself, Angela and uh, John and Panos. Um, okay, I'm sorry, I am uh, not finding it. I'm having trouble with, with the... Try and wiggling the mouse around, sweetheart, that normally does it. Um, that it, it came into a, another version. Know what happened now? Try try the escape button. Make sure make sure the zoom window is frontmost. Um, make sure. Sorry, say it again, Anthony. Make sure the zoom window where you see all of our pictures is the the, the frontmost window. And then you should see when you move the mouse a little menu at the bottom that includes. Well, the, the thing is that I'm not seeing the little buttons at the moment. 
as I, I was before. Yeah, make sure the Zoom window is frontmost. So click in the title bar of the window to bring it to the front. Okay, I think that's the problem. So I'm in Zoom now, but I'm still not seeing. Have you got the chat window at the side and the pictures at the top and a big picture of you in the middle? No, in this moment I'm not seeing your pictures. So the, can you see the chat window? Um, I can see now your pictures, but I cannot see the bottoms. That's the problem that the bottoms, I don't know what happened with my screen. Move, move your mouse over the, the screen. Mm. I don't know what is going on. Uh, th there, are, there are sometimes are two windows that Zoom has open. Try If it's not working in one, try the other. It doesn't always have two windows, but sometimes it does. Mm -hmm. Panos or John, do you have a copy of Angela's presentation? You could share it. I was about what? to say that. What, what if we present your presentation, Angela, and we can just flip slides, as you say? Yeah, OK. Have you got one, Panos, or shall I? Can you do that? I don't have to search for that. So if you have it handy, that would be great. Okay. Well, what's your call? What's yours called, Angela? Um, I sent it to all of you before the one that I was gonna do. Yeah, I'll, I'll have to go into the email. Hang on. I don't know what's going on. We, we actually rehearsed this earlier as well, and it worked then. Yeah, it, did, yeah. it did work well. I'm, I'm sorry about this problem, but I don't know what happened with my, with my, with my screen. No, it's not. I cannot get back into, into the bottoms. John, why don't you start? You have, do, do you have the presentation? Um, I'm just looking for it. So. I cannot find the way out. Because it'll probably be. I do have the one, uh, Angela, that you sent like two days ago, so I can start sharing if that's OK. Yeah, if you can do that, that'd be great. Yeah. Let me. Yeah, give me a sec. Okay, we, we see it. Okay, all right, okay, thank you. Okay. So basically, um, what we want to talk today is about the viability and sustainability approach. Now, I can't... Yeah, Panos has to change the slides. Yeah. Um, wait a minute, I'm going to put it back in so that I can follow my own. Have you found yours? Um, Wait a minute. I'm not being able to see now Panos, uh, the, the, the presentation that Panos has either. Yeah, I, we, 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 can, we can all see it. It's on slide two. All right, okay. Okay, okay. Right. So basically what we want is to um, share with you the, um, the approach that we have been developing with John uh, is basically based on the viable systems model that Stafford Beer developed long ago. And um, 
uh, is a theory about the organizational viability. And we have been uh, trying to reflect and to extend this original theory into the concept of sustainability. Um, so in this presentation, we're gonna try to present, uh, I'll present very briefly an introduction to the BSM and, um, and mention the implications that uh, viability has for sustainability. And then uh, John is gonna present an example of the application, a recent uh, example that we did in an eco village in Ireland. And then Panagiotis is gonna present a work that he has been doing recently uh, of applying the BSM and reflecting about the compatibility between the BSM and the strongly sustainable business model canvas. So that's the idea. Can we go to the next one? Um, the motivation for this is uh, obvious, it's very clear to this group of um, people that are here in this webinar. Uh, with the state of the world in, in this moment, the e economic crisis and the complete the resource depletion, peak oil and all the uh, other environmental factors that we know, the, the, there is a big need to change the approach on the way that we deal with businesses, uh, communities and nations. Can we go to the next one? Um, as uh, Einstein um, used to say, this is, there is a, 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 there is a new, complete new for a new paradigm and we, we cannot solve the problems that we have by using the same kind of thinking that, that we used uh, when we created them. So we really need to challenge our way of thinking and that's the reason we go to um, look for a new paradigm for under, understanding organizations. Yeah, can we go? Um, the best, uh, the, the best model that we have found uh, so far to explain the complexity that organizations have to deal with in the current environment is uh, the Babo Systems model that Stafford Beer developed uh, many, many years ago, more than 50 years ago, uh, and that uh, in his time, it was completely behind his time. Some people didn't really understand what he was talking about. He was talking about organizations as a, basically a neural networks, so saying that the best way of, of dealing with environmental complexity was to create organizations that were uh, not hierarchical, that were heterarchical, that were inspired in the idea of neural networks. Uh, his inspiration came from understanding the way that the brain deals with, physio with the organs of the body, all the communication between the brain and the organs, and how uh, all together manage to keep uh, ourselves uh, as individuals alive. So this concept of viability uh, has enormous uh, correlation with the way that all our organism uh, manage to, to maintain stability and adapt adaptability in the interaction with the, with the environment. So he called his theory the viable systems model. Um, the, his definition of viability is basically uh, any system that is capable of maintaining an independent existence, an autonomous existence. Yeah? And the focus of his theory was how a system you know, can be uh, in, in balance in the relationship with the environment. Any, any viable system, uh, can it be an organ, an organism, a, a human being, an animal, a, an ecosystem, a, an organization, a corporation, a nation, you know, any association of living systems that constitute in itself a system, a viable system, a, is a subject to the study of viability using this kind of theory. Uh, the focus of the theory has been in how to understand organizational systems as viable systems. And, um, and as such, uh, the focus is, uh, is, is always going to be in trying to model the interaction between an organizational system and the environment and to try to see what are the constraints on what are the resources and the capabilities that this system exhibit or doesn't exhibit that allows the system to be more or less viable. Okay? And now, uh, as I said before, our intention was to, how can we clarify what Stafford uh, uh, taught us in, in, in terms of the theory of viability? Uh, how can we expand it to the concept of sustainability? 
because it's not good enough to have a, an organization that is viable if we cannot have um, if we can if if we cannot maintain a healthy relationship with the environment from which we extract resources and to which we produce not only our products or services but also our waste. So how can we do it in a way that is not that that can remain over time not only financially or culturally but also in terms of uh, the economics and the environment? Okay. So the basic theory is that for differentiated the the model yet that you can see in the slide in the top hand uh, right, right hand is uh, the BSM. Uh, in Stafford recognized three types of components in any viable system. He called the oval in the bottom the operations and, and he uh, described it as the, the organizational teams that are directly, directly responsible for the production of products or services. Uh, so those are, let's say, the ones that implement the organizational purpose. Uh, the triangle above is called the meta system and it is basically the one responsible for managing resources and knowledge uh, to make sure that the operation is capable of performing effectively whatever is its purpose is uh, in terms of the products or services that it offers to the environment and in the environment that is the cloudy bit in, in, in the left hand side we have the customers we have the supplies and we have every other organization institution that is not within the boundaries of, of, of the viable system. So everything thing else will be in the environment, and obviously because the environment is everything else, we will focus only in the most, clo in the closest interactions uh, of the operational elements so, and the organization as a whole, that, are, as I, that include, as I said before, the customers, competitors, suppliers, and so on. So those are the three elements of the BSM, yep. Uh, then Stafford uh, the, the, uh, developed a language that uh, explains each one of the, of the five systems and he says that uh, systems one are the ones that um, perform operations, uh, so the o, the, the o in the operations, and then the meta system includes systems two, three, four, five that I'm going to explain in the next, uh, in the next uh, slides. Okay. So system one is basically the focus is in, um, uh, as I said, in operations. And um, the idea of system one is um, how can it, it always have an operational management that is a little square. And the interactions between the management and the operations should be balanced, meaning that the amount of knowledge and information that, that is, is managed between them should be managed accordingly to the complexity of the tasks and so it happens the same in the relationship between the operations and the environment so as you see most of the focus of the uh, mapping the analysis that we do with the vsm are uh, in terms of how well people and different roles uh, performing the, the basic uh, task in the organization how well they communicate with each other how well they, they manage their knowledge how, how well they manage their interactions between themselves and the environment. And um, so that's system one. Um, we can go to system two. Uh, system two is, is the one that avoids conflict, is the one that prevents oscillations in Stafford's language. Uh, what he says is that if we have an organization that is like a neural network, each one of the nodes of this organization should be uh, as autonomous as possible. But if we have the, if we want to create, to design this kind of heterarchical organization, network kind of organization, we need to guarantee that the, that the conflicts and the possible oscillations between the systems one are managed, are handled. So system two is the one that is there to prevent conflict uh, interfering in the viability of, of the organization, to avoid these oscillations, and it, it does it through developing all sorts of standards, um, information and communication systems, uh, communication protocols, um, um, conflict resolution mechanisms, uh, 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 and, and all sorts of other things, quality controls, and all sorts of other things that, that, that guarantees 
that uh, the share, share language and share mechanisms are used to ease facilitation between the systems one. So that's system two. Uh, and then system three uh, is basically the one that is responsible for generating cohesion between all the systems one and the, uh, and generating synergies, managing the synergies with them, within, 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 uh, around them. And, uh, and it basically does it by managing conversations about accountability, who is responsible for how, for what, how do I respond for, for whoever tasks and resources I, 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 I've been, I'm responsible for, and, uh, and to deal with the, uh, with the resource negotiations and to deal with norms, what are the, the rules of the game? How can we make sure that we respect the rules of the game, the rules of the organization, the rules of the environment? So that's what system three will do. Um, in the slides that we will share with you later, there are examples, but because John is gonna go into an example in deep and we don't have a lot of time, so I'm not gonna stop uh, with the examples uh, in this moment. And system three star is basically the one that is um, uh, monitoring, is uh, trying to catch up uh, informally information that can contribute to the understanding of what's going on at the operational level. Uh, so system three star will be, for example, a, a, an auditing, an sporadic auditing channel, a way of uh, sensing uh, the well-being, the performance, the, the, the mood of the people constituting the organization. And then we have system four, no? Stafford Beer used to say that we, we normally we can have a system one, two, three, three star operating together like the, like the um, here and now mechanism of the organization. But we always need to have a role of someone that is observing the outside, the environment, that is continuously monitoring what's going on out there and bringing, up, bringing into the organization information about uh, opportunities and threats, about um, uh, possibilities for innovation, possibilities for organizational development, possibilities for enhancing the markets, develop, developing new markets, new products, new services, and so on. So this is the system for role that is the adaptation mechanism, or is the adaptation role of the university, the one that is bringing innovation. So this is system four, and then um, finally we have system five, and system five will be the one that will be moderating the relationship, balancing the relationship between system three, which is a down-to-earth managerial function, and system four, that is a, a, a much more explorative, innovative, uh, strategic function. So system five will be coordinating conversations between three and four and making sure that the organization as a whole um, um, develop, a, a find a feasible and creative uh, route of action and route of development. So this is basically like the, the five systems. Now the, the model is focused on the interactions between systems one, two, and three. Uh, that Stafford called the inside and now, and as I said before, Stafford normally said that this interaction should be um, should be, uh, be very balanced between these, these three systems, and on the other side, focusing on the interactions between system three, four, and five, that is the adaptation mechanism. So how can we manage, balance, the way that the organization is working now with the changes in the environment that is continually changing. So how can we co-evolve with this changing environment will be the function of this uh, adaptation mechanism system 345. So those are the, the three kind of, uh, uh, mm, let's say, the, the main functions. Now, in the viable system, the way that we have been uh, uh, focusing the analysis uh, with John in our book is about how can we understand the idea of self-governance. Because Stafford used, used to base his ideas on ideas of self-regulation and self-organization. And the whole idea of this study is to understand how a well-structured organization can develop this capability for continuously observing itself, continuously observing the environment, and continuously re or restructuring itself 
readjusting its structure in, in such a way that it can keep a, a close to its purposes and can self-govern. And this is basically achieved by a very balanced interactions between system three and four and five, okay? Um, uh, in, the, in this final diagram, uh, we show what, what I suffered used to call, call the homeostats, that are the mechanisms to generate this balance between systems one and the environment, um, it is the uh, homeostat A, you know, between systems one, two, three, that is the homeostat B, between four and the environment, so homeostat C, and E between three or four and five. So what, what he suggested was that, that if we manage to have this kind of interactions balanced, then the possibilities for organizational viability and, and long-term sustainability are much more clear. So this is, let's say, the basic theory. What we have done is um, to try in, in our book is to take this theory and develop it a little bit further to clarify how these interactions with the environment, for instance, that are key for sustainability, need to be taken, uh, how uh, these issues of governance and self-governance will be fundamental for developing not only uh, organizational viability, but sustainability, meaning a sustainable way of interacting with the environment in the long term. So this is basically the theory, and uh, we have developed a methodology that we call the self-transformation methodology. We can go to the next one. Uh, Angela, be before you uh, move on, um, I, I just wanted to make a, 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 an observation uh, and, and have you comment on this. I remember us talking a, a little bit about this uh, when we were together earlier this year. Um, so yeah. for those of you on the call who are very familiar with uh, business modeling uh, tools such as the business model canvas or the flourishing business canvas, uh, w one of the things that is uh, worth highlighting is that the uh, visualization of the viable systems model, of which there is a, a, I think it would be fair to say, a simplified view on the screen at the moment, um, is, is not intended to be uh, directly a tool, a visual collaborative tool in, in, it, in its own right. Uh, one can kind of use it in that mode, uh, I think it would be fair to say. Uh, but it's not really designed as a canvas uh, in the way that we've been used to. Um, and um, I, I think one of the things that uh, got us interested uh, in collaborating earlier on and to try to bring these two worlds together uh, was that the power of the, the, the vi viable systems model um, is, is absolutely amazing, uh, but its accessibility remains challenging. And we were wondering if there might be ways of creating some sort of a uh, visual collaborative tool uh, that could somehow leverage VSM thinking um, uh, around this. So I, I, uh, I, I partly say all of this because when you first see the model and if you come from a business modeling perspective, you kind of expect to be able to use it, uh, use the model on screen here, like like a canvas and it really doesn't work that way. Uh, Angela, John, Thanos, do you have any, uh, do, do you agree with what I've just said or disagree? Uh, do you see the same opportunity that I, I highlighted? Angela, you, you speak yes, first. Yes, uh, uh, I, do, I, I do agree to some extent with what you say. Definitely this model is not uh, something that you can um, uh, understand from the five minutes explanation or 15 minutes explanation that uh, I have given you. It's a, it's, a, it's a very deep theoretical model and it's extremely rich, but it is not the, in me, the of immediate grasping. Uh, it, it, it will need a, a little bit of re reading and studying. And um, our, our whole life, both John and me, uh, have um, coincided in the purpose of making this model most, more accessible. That's what we try to do in the book. But definitely, if you compare it with business model Canvas, Canvas has an enormous advantage in terms of accessibility of the theory, precisely because it just focuses on issues that are, first of all, in more a common business language than the VSM, and second, because it, it is not providing you, let's say, with a, 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 with a lot of criteria for interpretation 
of what you the the information that is grasping uh, that that is uh, requesting from the users but it's more like a providing you with a way of mapping very complex issues in in a very simple way the vsm provides you with a way of interpreting first of all mapping uh, the, the complexity of an organization and second of interpreting analyzing and providing with criteria to redesign organizations which of course require a little bit more than um, than, the, than 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 the sort of analysis that you can do with, with business model canvas but they do complement each other uh, enormously and i think that there is a lot of very rich possibilities of combining these two approaches as Panagiotis is going to uh, show us uh, in a minute. I okay, just you know. a, a quick, quick comment from me. I, th I think um, I think one of the big problems with the model is that it's um, it, it's it's it comes at organisation from a very different perspective, and what what tends to happen is people have spent their whole lives working in hierarchies and traditional sorts of organisations. And they look at the model and they think, oh yeah, um, operation, that's the workers, oh yeah, meta system, that's the management, um, chief executives at the top. And I think the, well, one of the problems is that it, it, it is, because it's based on the human form, the, the brains at the top and the bodies underneath, and, and people reinterpret that as a hierarchy. And if you do that, the thing's almost impossible to understand, so people find it very difficult. Once you make the leap, from a hierarchical model to a model based on self-organization and instead of having um, a boss at the top and the whole organizational structure is lines of command making sure the people do what they're supposed to do underneath um, once you make the leap from there to a concept of self-organizing autonomous work groups and the whole concept of management becomes how do we bring the groups together how do we glue the parts together into a whole so the whole thing works more effectively and can do all sorts of things people couldn't do on their own and opens all sorts of new possibilities. Um, I think once you make that leap, the model itself isn't that hard. I mean, there are only five systems. I remember seeing some guy saying, okay, you don't even need two hands to count the number of systems. You only need one hand to count the five systems. And, uh, and I don't know. I mean, the, the, the more you work with it, the more straightforward it gets. But there is this leap away from traditional hierarchical thinking, which um, most people find very difficult. Uh, my, my take on that would be that, you know, I know exactly where you're coming from, Anthony, you know, the canvas versus the model and all that. Uh, I hope that in my part of the presentation, I might give like a glimpse of how that might be, you know, uh, the way, for example, I've, uh, we've used Mural, which is an online collaboration tool to, you know, almost use post-its on the, on an outline or a template of the of the model that can potentially you know lead to something much more user friendly you would say but let's i, I think we should keep going because mm -hmm. yeah we, we don't have enough time <laughs> and it's much later here than it is there <laughs> okay so uh should i go to the next slide uh, angela uh well i think that john i think that we can pass uh, the word to john now Perfect. Have you finished? I'll stop sharing. Yeah, and, yeah. Okay. I'll stick mine on. How are we doing? Is it coming through? Yes, we can see it, John. Uh, and Panos, would you care to comment on, on Dean's uh, question in the chat? Sure. Okay, John, over to you. Okay. Um, this is um, a story of some work that Andrew and I did about 10 years ago. We were, um, we were invited to this quite extraordinary place in Ireland, we're in a village called Clock, Clock Jordan, which is right in the middle of Ireland. And a group of a couple of hundred people that we, we met in Dublin, they bought this land, they started building, they started laying the foundations for roads and street lighting and fiber optics and 
um, solar panels and energy generation and sewage, all based on our state-of-the-art ecological um, sciences. And they got in touch with us because they, um, they, they had a whole bunch of problems. Um, I'll just go through these slides. These slides coming through, all right? Yes. Okay, good. So you can see the houses. Um, that's better. Loads of people there, lots of kids, donkeys. It was a whole community. And they were very, very excited about building this stuff. And uh, a number of very difficult economic problems hit them. They didn't have the organization to cope with the complexity of the environment they were facing. So they, they got in touch with, with us uh, because of the work that I'd done in cooperatives earlier. And they invited us over. And we spent, uh, we spent a couple of years um, going over there very, very regularly. And this is the story of... Who, uh, the, that's better. This is the story of what happened. One of the first things that we always do when we're working with a, a bunch of people, regardless of who they are, is to start off with uh, drawing cartoons because you get all sorts of information. You can see from this one, um, the one down the bottom left is a guy running blindfold up an escalator that's going down. Um, to the right of that, there's a body going in or a head going the other. Top one on the right is lots and lots of people talking and lots of people not knowing what's going on feeling disenfranchised and then this whole panic of everything that's going on on the computer so the, it was quite clear that they were pretty much um out of control and so we started to work with them we we started off with this uh, this big workshop and i think this is um this this in some ways answers your question anthony that we we actually used uh, the vsm to um, map the model in a completely participative, collaborative way. So we started drawing a big VSM and the not very well focused picture on the right hand side shows the work we actually did. And we start off by drawing the meta system and just with the canvas, the idea is you use the model as a different kind of lens to look at the organization that you're working in. So with the VSM, you say, okay, we've got to have these five systems. They've all got to be there. They've all got to be working properly. They've all got to be interconnected properly. There's got to be information flowing between them in particular ways. And there's also got to be information flowing between specific parts of the viable system and the environment within which it functions. So we started off and we said, okay, let's start with the meta system. Let's look at system two. System two is there to resolve conflicts, to stop the organization shaking itself to pieces. Who's doing that? And we sort of open this up to the group and people say, well, we think there's a group that does this, this and this, and that sounds like system two. So we have this discussion and this, this took us a couple of hours to do this. And we go through systems two, three, four, and five. And we mapped all the different parts of the organization onto this, this metasystemic diagram. Um, the reason that you can't see the operation in, in the systems one in this diagram is that they had 22 separate work groups, which had just sort of evolved. They, were, they basically asked all the members to say, okay, what are you interested in? And some people say, well, I'm really interested in transport or the internet or growing trees or permaculture. And these 22 groups had, sp had sprung up and they were trying to coordinate 22 groups. And one of the first things we did was to say, okay, well, let's look at the systems one and let's decide what your absolutely fundamental primary activities are. What are you actually doing here? What's the village for? And we went through these different categories and we managed to get the 22 down to seven, which is kind of the magic number for a VSM because seven works very, very nicely because there's lots of combinations of seven groups working together and you don't get overwhelmed with the complexity, which you do when you get much, much above that. And it's one of the, the golden rules that you always look for 
the number of systems won and make sure that that's the right sort of number, which is normally probably between five and eight. So we, we map this and the next slide is um, a sort of more pretty diagram of it. So um, these are all the different parts of the village, all the different organizational structures they put in place. And it was all very, um, they, they, they're very, very bright people. They did a really good job. But because they didn't have a, an overarching model, they just invented loads and loads and loads of new groups that hardly ever talked to each other. And what tended to happen was that um, the board of directors, which was appointed by the, the general meeting once a year, tended to get stuck with pretty much everything. So as you can see on this um, system two, the board, system three, the board, system three star, the board, system four, the board, system five, the board. The board was absolutely everything, doing everything. And of course, what they should have been was focused on system five. And I think probably um, one of the key things about understanding the model is that because it's based on the way the central nervous system and the brain and the autonomic nervous system and the whole body organizes itself, there is a vision of effective organization. So once you've defined the systems, you can say, okay, this is what we've got. This is the, the warts and all mapping of our organization onto a viable system model. And then the question is, how do we get from here to what the model says is effective organization? And that's really the whole process of doing a diagnosis. Going through the first stage, which is mapping the, the various systems. And then you move on and say, okay, this is what we've got. Where do we go next? So what we found from this diagnosis, and again, this is, this is over months and months and months of work and talking with everybody and training them in the viable systems model and we were getting to know them and getting to know how the village worked. And it was clear that 22 work groups was just crazy, just didn't work at all. So those were, um, those were dealt with. Uh, board was everywhere, which meant it couldn't be effective because it was just doing far too much. System three, was very weak because it was unfocused. There were lots of different parts doing it. Same with system four. Um, the information flows were terrible. Almost nobody knew what anybody else was doing. Uh, one of the meetings, we were going through the, um, the work groups and somebody said, whatever happened to so-and-so, so-and-so? Have we ever met? Did we ever meet? And nobody could remember if they'd met. And there were certainly no reports. And, and so very little information flowing between three and four, which again is one of the key organizing parts of the model. So um, Andrew and I went away and we sort of thought about this and we made some proposals and we drew a, what we thought would be a, a new structure for the village. So number of systems one reduced to seven uh, and you can, know, can you read them on here? Things like growing the infrastructure, the green infrastructure, building and maintaining the site, selling the site, um, building houses, building the community houses, education, creating a sustainable community. These kind of um, have evolved, but this is where they were at the time. Um, so we sorted out the systems one. We made sure that the role of coordinator was very, very seriously taken because before the groups met very sporadically, never reported back, didn't really come together to try and coordinate everything. So, the role of coordination was sorted. We got the right number of systems one, and then we designed a system three, which needed to be fit for purpose, i.e. to be in balance with its, with its operation. So this was articulated by a regular meeting of the coordinators coming together to discuss system three issues, and the same with system four. The other groups which were doing three and four work fed into this the central system three uh, body. Um, and system five, which was the board, um, were basically told to keep, keep out of all the other stuff that was going on and focus on policy issues and, and therefore they, um, they, 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 were, they were very happy about all this. So they basically did what they needed to do and left everybody else to get on with it and monitored the, the, the process. So this is a complete organizational transformation. And uh, we, we were invited to um, 
come and see how it was working after um, probably a couple of years of after we started. And we, we arrived at the coordination meeting. And the way they did it, they said, okay, we need, we need an hour for system three. So what they did, they put all their work plans on the wall in this big hall. And then they all went around in a big circle, all looking at everybody else's work plans. And then they came back together and said, okay, what can we do collectively and collaboratively that we can't do in isolation? And there was just tons and tons of stuff came out of it. And people were saying, well, look, there's a permaculture course happening in three months time. And that'll be really good if we can get all those people to help with the, um, if we can get the people coming to the village to look around and we can try and sell them some sites. And a whole range of things came out of it. Um, and similarly, system four, after the hour on system three, there was now system four, which again, system four looks outside, checks the outside world, looks for threats and opportunities, comes up with schemes. And that was done in the same meeting. So the connection between three and four was very, very beautifully designed. And there was an inner group of all the coordinators and around the outside, there were various people who had legal knowledge and other sort of expertise and the board who were there to make sure that everything was working within policies of, um, of the village. So, um, this is a summary of all the stuff that went on, which you can look at at your leisure, but this is, I basically covered most of this. And that was it. Do you wanna add anything to that, Angela? Um, no, well, I think that um, basically that was the story. Uh, we had a lot of participation of the people. We, I think that we did a, an interesting change on the tradition on how to use the VSM in the sense that we wanted people to learn about this theory. We, we wanted to make it as understandable as possible. So, so we created a process group that was a, a group of people, the group of people that learned more in detail the theory and they, they will stay there and they will be the ones um, implementing the changes and facilitating the change, the, the change process. And, and then they were the ones that uh, continued to some extent uh, using the, these ideas when we left. So uh, in general, it was a very interesting learning experience for, for, for everyone. Okay, I'll stop sharing. Uh, were there any questions now from anybody? If there's any uh, questions on the village and the application, probably a good time to do that now. So for the, uh, I, I have one question, John. Uh, for the uh, people working in the village, um, could, could you just give a sense of how much time, when you did that first uh, session where you had the photo of, of people having written on that flip chart, how much time did you have to spend uh, before the quality of what they were writing was useful? Well, because we were directing the, the discussion, if, if somebody came up with um, um, a suggestion for one of the systems that was clearly wrong, we'd be able to say, well, actually, no, it's more like this and you have to think about that. So it was fairly instantaneous. I mean, it was actually, I mean, once you define the systems one, you say, okay, here are systems one. What are the problems that emerge when they interact? What are the conflicts? What are the, what are the, the difficulties? And how do you deal with that? And w when you ask it very specifically in that context, it's actually fairly instantaneous to get some useful answers. And the same with system three and four is very clear because who's thinking about the future, who's looking outside, who's making plans for the next 10 years. And there are always people in those roles. So it's, it's, that's fairly instantaneous. The, um, the, the difficulty is taking all that and putting it together into a, into a complete model of, of the village to make sure you haven't missed anything, they haven't missed anything, um, that you've got all the various elements working together. And that takes a long time. And then of course, the whole thing about what to do about it, what proposals to make, that takes huge amounts of discussion. That takes a long time. Um, uh, th there's quite a few questions uh, of, and observations in the chat, uh, John, and, and now that you've finished uh, presenting, you might want to take a look at those and see if you have anything to add to, to those comments. Uh, I, I wanted to highlight uh, one thing that uh, I've observed, and Simon, I see you've made a very similar comment, uh, and that's um, how purpose uh, really triggers 
uh, is a big part of what you do in the in the VSM at System 5, if I recall correctly. And uh, certainly in our work with the Flourishing Business Canvas, we've been making use of Simon Sinek's uh, Golden Circle uh, tool, which is all about starting with why, starting with your purpose uh, as an organization, um, and in fact, aligning that to individual purpose. Um, so I, I think this, there's another point of intersection here that uh, is, is really very helpful. Very helpful. Yeah, I, well, I, I will. Yeah, go ahead, Angela. Well, I, 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 I just want to respond that we do focus import, very importantly in purpose all the way to all the way through. I, I will say that the, the idea of, of viability can be translated into being being capable of implementing your purpose, and that's something that you have to be reviewing all the time. So. So understanding the organizational purpose, agreeing on the organizational purpose and all the details on what does it mean in practical terms to put that into practice is the focus of the analysis. So it is around that understanding of purpose that one or another form of organization makes sense and is more or less interesting and effective. So yes, I will say that there is a huge complementarity between the two approaches. In, in that respect that both of them are very well focused in terms of purpose on one side and interaction with the environment on the, on, on the other, yeah. I have a question, it's, uh, it's Peter Jones, hi. Uh, I really liked uh, the presentation, it's a good case study. I wonder, in, uh, the question is in working with um, uh, the village and the, and, and the participants um, you know, over time, uh, how did you start to translate um, the design, you know, the, the, the framework from VSM to kind of working labels and functions within um, within their own organization? Did did people, you know, did the the participants themselves see what they would then want to call? Well, of course, they had the board, but in terms of kind of naming the seven functions and creating you know, creating their own frameworks and identifying the, you know, the other, uh, you know, the systems two through four, which are actually pretty unique until you start working with VSM. Those are new concepts for people. How did you translate those with people that are working in such a, I don't know, a vernacular context like an echo village? Well, they, they, they did it themselves. In, in fact, one of the, uh, one, of, one of the joys of doing this was that we'd, um, we'd be away for a few months and come back and, uh, and, and you, you just be listening to conversations and people saying, oh, well, of course, we've got these primary activity groups now. And they've taken on primary activity, which is very, um, very basic VSM vocabulary. Um, they christened the system for navigation, which is a very nice word for it. I mean, I've, it's, it's the only place I've ever come across anybody using that. But it's one of the words I use mm. when, when people want a clear, th clear description of system four. Um, so some of the other systems weren't, um, weren't so, so, so clearly... Um, derived, but but certainly in the meetings they'd actually use the vocabulary. They say, okay, we're going to do an hour on system three. So we're looking at synergies. We're looking for ways that we can collaborate and help each other. And the the, the, the basic VSM um, model was adopted by a group of people in the village who um, mm -hmm. worked with it incredibly effectively in the first the first couple of years we were there because we were working very intensely. And this, of course, no, for them there was a huge amount at stake. I mean, this was their their entire future. I mean, they'd all sell their houses, and move to the village, and if it collapsed horribly, then they, you know, they'd all be in serious trouble. So there was enormous motivation to make this work. So in terms of the um, the, the model, they, they, they a lot of them took it on and became very, very good at it. And there was a couple of people, particularly, that um, should be lecturing in universities about this because they're a lot better than a lot of the people who are actually doing it. <laughs> Well, the reason I was asking is I think once it's actually owned by uh, participants within an organizational system, they can start, uh, like the idea of, of the navigation, or you could call it strategic navigation as a function, or translation, um, you know, a um, sensing, environmental sensing, or what the functions, if they, if, if they own, you know, if they own their own um, mental models of, of those functions and start to put them in use, if they rename them and start to, you know, create them as, as continuous functions, because as time goes on, they aren't going to call them as they kind of hand off the functions to other people that they're working with. They probably will 
start to translate it into terms other than VSM anyway. It's, so I'm thinking there it has to be this type of translation process in most organizations to make, to make it um, authentic to, um, you know, to, to new people that are working with it. You may not, you know, have to work with it in abstract terms. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. And, and, and that worked very successfully. I think the, the other thing I should mention is that um, um, the, the, there was a quite a, a reasonable group of people who, who did take it on, learn it extremely well, put it into practice, did a really good job, work with all the stuff that wasn't working quite as we'd expected. And, and, and they were just brilliant. But a lot of people, a lot of people never got the hang of it at all. A lot of people found it too complicated, didn't like it. And I remember going back after a couple of years and saying, um, you know, should we, should we try, try and organize something about the VSM? And there was this, this phrase, oh God, everybody's suffering from VSM fatigue. We're so sick of <laughs> VSM. We just, wanna, we just wanna forget about it for a bit. So, I mean, there is this sense of um, um, the people who take to it and the people that don't. Um, uh, and that's something quite basic about the way people's minds work. And you find that in every class that you do, some people come up and say, you know, I've been waiting all my life for this. This is, this is, I've always known organizations work like this, but I've never, this is the first time I've ever heard it explained properly. And other people who hate it and say, you know, this was just rubbish and I never want to see anything like this again. And there's some people that will just never make the leap to think in those terms. So um, the difficulty with that is that, um, that there, was, there was a lot of stuff in the village with people saying, um, you're creating a priesthood. And there are the VSM, um, the people who know it incredibly well, who are saying, well, the VSM says we should do this. And it was almost becoming like a, like a <laughs> authority <laughs> structure that VSM says. So you say, oh, yes, of course, okay. And, and, and of course, in, in, in cooperatives and eco-villages, people hate that sort of thing. So there is this real challenge of making it accessible, which is one of the things that Anthony was talking about at the beginning. And it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a real issue. Mm -hmm. so I, think, uh, I, I want us to move on to panels because uh, th there's the third part of the story here that I think we, we need to hear. Okay, uh, very good. So uh, I, I know this conversation could keep on going for a while. Um, Simon, I think I saw you ha uh, had your hand up though. Uh, do you want to comment now or, or do, do we leave it to the end? Yeah, maybe, um, maybe this is like one question for panels to think about as you talk, so I'm aware of time couple of things. Are there kind of some transitionary stages you can go through without having to introduce the whole model? And also one thing, one way in which like Maria and I operate when really going into complexity systems thinking is that we often don't reference the very theories and models that we're working with. We create interventions that are inspired by the thinking and this gets around the the issue of people rejecting something that is actually requires quite a lot of knowledge um, and understanding so this is my other question how how is it possible to implement the model without necessarily using it explicitly is this another mode of use yeah very good point and i think that uh, in my experience, a lot of consultants actually, you know, hide the fact that they know VSM, that they know it's in their toolbox, they will never disclose it to the client for obvious reasons. In our case here, the, you know, the, the case I'm going to present here, it was one of the rarest, you know, cases of a client saying, you know, oh, by the way, I want VSM. I was like, what? How do you know about it? And it was like this, this rare you know, case of a client that A, is very well educated on what sustainability is, has a system sticking background and knows VSM. And it was like an amazing opportunity to work on that. So let me uh, tell you a bit more about this project. So a bit about the objectives and the process that we followed. So this is a company that uh, is a spin-off of a larger company that is basically one of the leading uh, companies in Greece dealing with uh, natural cosmetics and the spin-off that we're working with is uh, is starting to deal with uh, natural and organic uh, food products. Now they had this idea of creating a cluster, a cluster of companies that would involve uh, academia, uh, 
beekeepers and uh, farmers and research institutions and create this cluster that would uh, actually uh, promote sustainability, both for farmers, for the company itself. So they were creating some kind of an ecosystem around the company. So as often happens with any kind of consulting or especially with systems analysis projects, you know, the client didn't really know what they wanted. So originally we thought, you know, we're going to use the business model canvas and some of the VSM to um, model out, you know, the, uh, this cluster and see, you know, what we can do to improve it. It turns out that there wasn't a cluster. And it, this took us like a month to realize that there wasn't really a cluster. So even though we thought we we're going to go into a diagnosis mode, similar to what John presented, you know, having an established organization of sorts and then working with them, we, we realized that actually they're designing that cluster. So it was a more a design mode uh, rather than a diagnosis or improvement mode. So the updated project was to actually envision a future business model. So we chose a fairly close to, uh, to the present date of 2020, where we thought that you know, this cluster will be established and well working and uh, how it can help you know, uh, communicate the benefits and expectations to prospect members. So the idea was uh, how they can use this kind of uh, business model, uh, to, and of course we use the canvas, to explain it and tell the story to prospect members that would like to join the cluster. And by the way, as a side note, oh, how can we use VSM to actually see how the governance system of that uh, cluster will work. So we had like a four step process. Uh, we did some data collection and uh, we, we, fir we first, you know, developed a, an initial canvas. Then we realized, you know, that this was getting very too, too complex. I will explain that later. So we had a second data collection. We did some VSM modeling and then uh, we uh, starting after we developed a more extensive uh, model, we developed some stories that they could then use to uh, recruit members to the cluster. And we, of course, we went up with a project report. Uh, so what I will be showing you here is excerpts from that report. So the first thing that we did, so as I said, we, know, we, we started gathering information based on their marketing material and uh, other kinds of, um, information that they verbally communicated to us. And as you can see from this uh, first attempt to uh, put everything on, on, on the canvas, this was getting too complex very, very, very quickly. So with different colors, we have, uh, we're co color coding the different sorts of information, be it like marketing materials or websites or other kinds of internal documents. And this was getting really quickly out of hand. You know, we weren't really sure how to organize this amount of information. They were very ambitious too. They wanted to do all sorts of stuff. So then we you know, had the idea of how can we, maybe we should start applying some VSM thinking from, from the start. And this is what we did. And, and to your, to your uh, point, Simon, this is a, not really a VSM idea only. It's like a more universal nested systems approach, but this is so integral to what VSM is. And the fact that, you know, you have, um, the recursive levels, this is the VSM language now, you know, of different primary activities being nested within each other. So we apply this kind of thinking and we realize that basically if we put the cluster at level zero, it seems like that is part of a larger system, the agro bio market segment. This is what we thought would be like the larger system. And within it, and this is the really interesting stuff, when we go a level down, so what are the parts of this cluster? It seems that it had like three main parts. It wasn't so explicit until we did this analysis. They had a research part of the cluster, an education part, and a production part. Up until this point, this was a bit, you know, uh, let's say messy and uh, cloudy. You know, everybody would coordinate, you know, and cooperate with each other. We're going to do like research and production, education. But we kind of said that, you know, we have to separate things in a way or study these things in, in, in different in different forms. So this is what we did. So we identified these three different parts of the cluster. And then we said, you know, so this is part of the analysis. So we said that not only do we identify these different parts, but based on VSM theory, 
this would be autonomous too. So it's not just, you know, this is going to be just a part of the cluster. This means that this comes with some, you know, responsibilities, if you like. The research part should have its own meta system, its own, you know, processes that will keep it autonomous. So we had some warning there, some, you know, uh, uh, some um, lies. So as you can see here, I say that the operational management implications of this structure can be met. So that was part of us, you know, designing for them. So this was a, pro a proposal of how the cluster could be designed. And we're very clear about, you know, this shouldn't be taken lightly. If you actually agree with this structure, this can have a, a huge impact on the actual governance system. So then after we had established that, these three main components and they actually agreed, that simplified and really accelerated the building of the, of the uh, canvas. So here is the final product of the canvas. And I know it seems very complex. Actually, we, we realized that what we were actually doing is creating three different canvases for the three different components of the cluster. So we're putting everything here. So we color code again. Yellow are like the common stickies that refer to the whole cluster. And then we had red stick is for the production part of the cluster, green for the research one, and so on. So you can use this VSM uh, idea of the primary activities and apply it straight away on the canvas and organize the information. So you have all the information about the primary activities organizing all of the boxes. So you have like stakeholders specific for the specific parts of the cluster. You have uh, uh, resources specific for that part for the production part of the research part of the education part and of course like horizontal parts which are the yellow ones once we have done that and maybe you can see like the governance part here is not so well developed that is because we were explicitly saying well and this is the interaction between the canvas and the and the and the, uh, and the vsm that actually what the vsm does is really exploding and exploring this governance box. So this is what we did. So we kind of kept some stickies there as a placeholders of who actually is involved based on the canvas. But we said, you know, for more explanation of what this governance means, look to the next stage. Uh, I'm not, I don't, I don't think I have the time to really go into the, how we use the canvas. Here you can see like examples of, you know, the goals and outcomes and how they differentiate between something that is horizontal and something that is more uh, specific to a production part. And again, the same here, but I wanted to more focus on the governance analysis or otherwise the VSM. So we started with a template. We, we put that in the, on, on Neural, which is the same online collaboration tool that we often, we actually also use to create the, uh, the stickies for the canvas. And, and I, I have to kind of disagree. I think you can use the VSM for collaborative model building. This is what we did. And we started putting our stickies on, on this empty template. And this is what we came up with. Uh, I have to explain, of course, some of these uh, items here. So for example, we have blue representing processes, uh, purple representing people or entities, and then uh, arrows representing flows of information and relationships. So there was kind of an organized, uh, uh, a, la a language, a key to what sort of stickies we're putting on on the uh, on the uh, on the model. As an example, if we focus on the first system one here, we have I have an excerpt, so I'm looking at this bottom part of the VSM. So I have like the production part, which interacts with parts of the environment. So you can see here like flows of products going to the end consumer. In the production part, you have the production cluster members, and uh, here as processes for the for the local management of the production you have marketing and sales specific for production procurement specific for production and so on and so forth and we, of course we say here that we have to be we have to determine this kind of management processes so that's an example of a system one uh, we also were very clear about that these three systems even though we said we you know we have three different parts of the cluster they really interact with each other so there's no point in actually just Imagine these as silos. There is continuous feedback between education, production, and research, and this is why actually you have to create a cluster. But of course, we had to develop a more detailed analysis on that. 
here you can see an example of system two. And we have, for example, activities like uh, cluster community animation, join cluster events that are very good in uh, uh, actually doing this oscillation dumping that Angela was referring to before. And we're referring to who could possibly doing this uh, thing. We imagine like a consultation group that would actually take charge of this thing. System three, it could be the company that would do this role or consultants that actually ask, ask Better My Business to be involved in this, uh, in the running of the cluster. Different sorts of activities, resource management, contract management, and how it interacts with uh, the rest of uh, the organizations. So they were providing staff, funding, goals, but also there should be some kind of impact and performance reporting. System three star, certification audits, that was a big part of uh, the whole cluster because they were going for organic. System four was interactions with uh, mainly two bodies, uh, the uh, potential members. So there was a lot of recruiting going on. And here we can see like the outreach activities, but also to potential investors and lenders. So we mapped all these kind of uh, interactions between uh, these uh, uh, entities, as well as the, the required activities. And finally, uh, this is the, the overall a very draft, you know, interaction of how the overall environment uh, flows. So, for example, we have like somebody like a farmer that participates uh, in an education activity can quickly jump into an interested potential member that should be dealt with uh, uh, through System Four. And to close the uh, the level, you know, at System Five, you have things like the code of ethics, the cluster goals, the high level decision making. They were very clear who was going to do that, and this actually led to. Uh, very interesting discussions that hadn't really thought about who was going to do this kind of high level thinking. So one of the outcomes of this, uh, you know, intervention was that they realized that when you have a cluster, there should be by design a balance between how much of the cluster will be self-organized and how much the company is willing to take some of these roles. But by using VSM, we're able to show exactly where the company could and is willing to intervene. Would it be like at the system five level or the system four level or the system three level? All of these, you know. So they now could have a language to understand their, the implications of their involvement and creation of this cluster. So just some project wins. We use this hierarchical structuring to identify the main areas. We could cut through complexity through all this amount of information. We develop the canvas, you know, to uh, the, actually help them do uh, tell meaningful and effective stories. We provide a common language, both with the Canvas and the VSM, to uh, help them design a more effective cluster. And we capture existing and potential new value co-creations, and we identify the tons of gaps and opportunities to uh, improve the cluster. Uh, so that was it in a nutshell. <laughs> I think we have like, what, five minutes for questions? <laughs> We, we, we do. Uh, and I was seeing like a lot of comments like lining up. So I don't know, uh, would somebody, Anthony, would you like to? Uh, I'll, I'll, see what I, I'll see what I can do. I, I was just going to um, observe, uh, we have quite a few other people on the call who are also first explorers of the Flourishing Business Canvas. And um, uh, what, what isn't apparent from the way that panels described this was um, we, we didn't really do the storytelling side of it today, and uh, we've really taken a very technical approach, I would say, to sharing uh, sharing this today, uh, rec recognizing this is an expert audience. Uh, but, uh, you know, typically we would never, ever show a complete canvas to somebody uh, without uh, starting with a blank one and, and building it up piece by piece. Um, uh, this is... Uh, Sometimes we call this cognitive murder, showing people complete canvases. But uh, you're talking about the presentation now, or to the client? Uh, I'm saying today we we committed cognitive murder because we knew we had an expert audience. But with clients and others, we would never. Uh, do oh, it. I would never do that. But this is just to show you the uh, the methodology rather than the uh, actual, you know, what it involves. You know, it's uh, I wouldn't dare, you know, even explain the cluster. Uh, exactly. I, I just wanted to make this point for some first explorers on the call who maybe are, are not aware of, the, of this vital a aspect. Um, yes, yeah, so um, uh, uh, there seems to be some thank yous coming in on the chat. Uh, if anybody asks some questions, I'm just trying to go back. I've, there's a lot of private messages coming to me as well, so I, I'm having a hard time seeing. Yeah, okay, I'm reading about some of this. Let's see. Um, oh, the colouring system, uh, uh, Simon, you commented, um, 
but one of the things we've been playing with is different coloring systems in different circumstances. And uh, I, I don't think we uh, yet have enough experience to be able to make a, a strong recommendation as to one coloring system versus another. It seems to be very, it needs to be almost designed uh, on a case by case basis. Um, and you saw, in fact, Panos uh, on the mural had invent had a little uh, color key cut chart to explain what the color coding yes. uh, and and we we seem to uh, he's just going back there now uh, this, this seems to be a common thing that we're finding we need to do there on the left uh, that we we have to do with, uh, with some other comments that came in here uh, Eric, uh, the arrows, whether the arrows of the VSM could uh, represent the relationships or stories I think. My take is that the arrows are implied on the canvas when you tell the story. And I think we've talked about that, Anthony, how hmm. you know, arrows are actually in, in the uh, ontology of the model you develop, there are actually you know, relationships like connected with arrows, but you can't really do that, I don't know, when you're telling a, uh, a story. You're actually connecting through the story. When you go to the underlying ontology, uh, the strongly sustainable business model ontology, you'll find that the verbs that connect the questions together are all apparent in the ontology. They're not apparent directly on the canvas. They're sort of implicit and implied at the boundaries between each of the question boxes. I think one of the things that we need to think about is how do we make those verbs a little bit more obvious, because those are actually the verbs that you need to tell the stories that connect the boxes together. So I think that's a, a, a useful point. And I, I, I think, Eric, your, uh, your intuition is, is correct that there are some interesting potentials of, of looking at the verbs implied by the lines on the VSM model in the same, in the same way, perhaps. Simon, you had a question. Uh, sorry, Saya, you had a uh, question. No, oh, hang on. Uh, yeah, just quickly. It's, I, I'd love to actually see the canvas in detail. Is it possible to get a high definition Copy. Unfortunately, unfortunately, no. This is quite, you know, um, you know, confidential, and they haven't yeah, really no. gone. And I have to say something I forgot to say. One of the outcomes of uh, this project is that um, even though they started with a very, uh, like, a cluster perspective on, on what they were creating after the intervention, and I think after they realized what it really means to to govern this thing, they they decided that they would call it a holding. So it will be like a more solid partnership rather than just a more open, you know, participatory or, you know, you can, everybody can join. So, yeah. So there were outcomes like really big ones that came out of this uh, intervention, but unfortunately I cannot share the, um, we cannot share the, um, yeah, the canvas. No, uh, yeah, I appreciate that. We're having a bit of difficulty getting permissions ourselves. We'd love to share one or two canvases. So it's, We've got the same um, challenge, but thanks to the presentation. Really interesting the way you linked Canvas with VSM. Really, really great joint presentation. Thank you. Yeah, we'll, ha we'll have to, I mean, given we have mutual NDAs between all the first explorers, we, we ought to, within that community, be able to figure out something, I, I think, practically. But, uh, uh, you know, Simon and uh, uh, Panos, maybe that's something you'd like to explore with each other offline a little bit and, and see if you can come up with a proposal and. Uh, that uh, could could be uh, useful. Um, okay, a lot, lots of very positive comments. Uh, kudos to uh, our speakers today. Uh, this is some of the most uh, fulsome praise in the moment that uh, I think I can remember coming in on the chat. So good job, everybody. Um, and um, I, I think uh, Peter, I don't know if you're still on the call, but uh, uh, Andrew and John. Uh, said uh, while we were just warming up that uh, they are quite keen to come to visit Toronto and so I thought that I would mention this with the idea that perhaps uh, uh, some uh, S-Lab uh, talking up uh, speaking opportunities and uh, design with dialogue opportunities might present themselves uh, and, and uh, maybe other things as well so uh, Panos uh, I'll leave that with you to perhaps coordinate with Peter uh, what sure. um, be possible for? I, I think we're talking about Q1 2019. Andrew and John, you, you're both un unmute. You both. Hang on, let me just. Uh, Andrew, was that correct? Q1 next year. Uh, it's possible. We can consider. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'd love to go back to Toronto. I lived there for uh, for a year, so it'd be, be great for me to go back and uh, see what Young Street looks like now. 
<laughs> okay, well, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, just to let you know, next month, uh, I, I uh, subject to final confirmation, but I believe uh, Bill Craig will be our speaker next month. Uh, he is the current chairman, uh, sorry, current uh, the chair of uh, the Canadian Positive Psychology Association. Uh, as many of you know, the uh, goal of positive psychologists is to uh, figure out uh, how to help humans uh, achieve their highest potential. They call that highest potential flourishing. Uh, and uh, Bill um, and the Canadian uh, Positive Psychology Association have been very um, focused on flourishing of individuals in an organizational setting. Uh, so he's going to be talking about the work that they've been doing in the CPPA uh, and uh, uh, work they plan to be doing and opportunities for uh, people in this uh, group to uh, perhaps get engaged in, in that. So that's next month's presentation. Uh, November, uh, I'm, I'm very excited that uh, uh, one of our uh, very early members and a really, in, uh, uh, really critical players in our field, uh, Dr. Florian Ludecker Freund, uh, will be presenting uh, with uh, Alexander Joyce and uh, uh, Sarah. Uh, I'm going to forget Sarah's surname, which is really bad, um, on their new work uh, that's just been published uh, on patterns of sustainable business models. Uh, this is a major update to the work that uh, Nancy Bocken uh, did uh, four years ago now or so. Uh, and uh, quite a few of us on the, on, in the group have been involved in helping with this research as experts. Uh, so that uh, will be very exciting to, to get an update on, on that. Uh, I'm looking for a speaker for December. I think, if I remember correctly, um, I think I have now a speaker lined up for uh, January, who will be the Flemish government, uh, reporting on their exploration of using business modeling as part of a new policy for encouraging green business in Flanders in Belgium. And uh, our February presentation will be Eric Fafcombs, who's on the call today, uh, reporting on his work uh, around business models for innovation clusters. Uh, so this might be quite complementary, actually, to today. He's just finished his uh, master's research on this topic, so uh, uh, that will be February. So uh, December and March I'm looking for, so if anybody has any ideas, uh, please let me know. Thank you all very much. Have a wonderful evening. The recording will be up uh, probably tomorrow morning, my time, because it's rather late here. So uh, I'll let my computer do, hand, process it overnight. Cheers, guys. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.